kids, that the horse evolved from a four-toed horse, okay? This biology book admits this much, uh, included much repeated gradual evolution of the modern horse has not held up to close examination. Fifty years ago, G.G. Simpson, a very famous brand name evolutionist, said, the evolution of the horse family was unintentionally falsified. It's been proven for 50 years, the horse story that's in your textbooks is not true. But they're still teaching it. Simpson said, the uniform continuous transformation of the, of the horse series, basically, did never happen in nature. But they say, they have evidence. This is one of the best evidences used for evolution. Darwin considered this the best piece of evidence for his theory. He said, the embryo growing in the human has, has gills. This textbook says, the presence of fish-like structures in embryos of different species shows that these animals have evolved from fish and share the basic pattern of fish development. They want you to think that's a gills like a fish? That's simply a lie, folks. That's been proven wrong 128 years ago. Those are not gills. Those little folds of skin develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. I've seen people that have five or six chins and they can't breathe through any of them but the top one, okay? <laughs> this is simply a lie. Haeckel read Darwin's book the year after it came out when it was translated to German, and Haeckel said, wow, what a great theory. This gets rid of God. If only we had some evidence for this theory. And Ernst Haeckel, an embryology professor at the University of Jena in Germany, lied. He took a drawing of a dog and a human, and he faked, he lied, he changed them, he made them look alike. Here are the actual drawings. These are his fake drawings. He changed all sorts of things to make them look alike. Haeckel made giant charts of his fake drawings and traveled all over Germany and held seminars on why everybody should believe in evolution. Actually, here are Haeckel's drawings compared to actual photographs taken a couple years ago. He lied. My point is, this is still being used in textbooks today as evidence for evolution. I care. I think some other people care too. Get the lies out of our books. My point is, if you have some evidence for evolution, then show me. But don't lie to the kids. Don't tell them the embryo. Officer, if you can keep it in, in line, please, okay? I don't want to have to uh, uh, waste, up my, waste my time. Uh, we'll be glad to take questions, okay? But uh, grow up a little bit and wait your turn, okay? This is simply a lie, but it's used in textbooks all over the world. It was proven wrong in 1874. Here it is in a 94 textbook. Here's another 94 textbook. Here's Tim Barra still teaching it. Ken Miller still teaching it in a 1998 textbook. I could talk for hours. I debated Ken Miller. Here's a 98 textbook used in Pensacola, Florida, still teaching the same lie. This one shows, says, as they suggest evolution from a common ancestor because of the presence of gills. This is simply not true. Here's a 2001 textbook used for junior high saying that the similarities provide evidence that these three animals evolved from a common ancestor. Now look, that's not true. They don't provide such evidence. But the books teach this over and over and over. It's in books. I've been to 30 countries in all 49 states. It's in books all over the world, folks. They're teaching the same thing. They're saying it's not a human yet. It's a human at conception. Every doctor knows that. They teach it doesn't have gill slits. This is baloney. So if you have evidence for evolution, show me. But don't lie to these kids. Come on. We can go for hours and hours on lies in the textbooks. All I want is very simple. Get the lies out of the books. Then the books will be fine. There's a lot of good science in the books. We're not against science. But we're against supporting a lousy theory with false ideas, that's all. Let's just teach the truth. Teach science to the kids, and I think you'll find evolution will have to slowly slip through the cracks, and that's what they're really worried about. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a question and answer time now, and... Uh Dr. Trevor is going to receive the first question. Uh, he's going to have about two minutes. We're not going to hold him real tight to that, but we're about two minutes to answer the question, to, to finish, finish responding, or if you respond sooner, that's fine. And then uh, Dr. Hoven's going to have an opportunity to comment on that, and uh, then we'll go back and forth and uh, for approximately a half hour for the question and answer uh, period. So I hope your question gets in, but obviously we couldn't get all the questions. There must be like 100 questions there. So, All right. I'm going to get this microphone. Our first question will be for Dr. Trivers. Dr. Trivers? How would you explain fossilized clams on top of Mount Everest? Oh, 
Oh, I see. Okay, now it's working. Uh, question is, uh, how would I explain fossilized plants on Mount Everest? And assuming there are fossilized plants on Mount Everest, I wouldn't have any great difficulty. What's that? What did I say? Fossilized clams. What did I say? Huh? Yeah, what did I say? It's clams we're talking about? Oh, okay. Um, uh, so that we're all on the same page, the question has to do with fossilized clams, not plants on Mount Everest. And I say, assuming that such exist, uh, then I'd have to understand the geological history of the mountain. If you're a recent creationist, it all happened 6,000 years ago, and everything else is a lie, then mountains haven't changed an awful lot, except for this enormous scouring of water that took place in this deluge, unless you believe another fantasy that the water was hidden away inside and popped out, or another fantasy of Dr. Uh, Hovind's that it all came in a, a meteor uh, with water until it was shown that that would be vaporized. It's well known that mountains rise uh, through the tectonic uh, forces that are generated by tectonic plates. So I'll, I'll just switch it. I don't know Mount Everest, never been there. Uh, but I have spent a lot of time in Jamaica, and it is well known that the mountain in Jamaica, uh, which is 7,600 feet, was, uh, uh, came up. Uh, from the ocean. On my own property that's about 2,000 feet up, not on a mountainside, you can find uh, limestone, which of course is, is being generated um, um, by uh, living creatures in coral reefs, and within the limestone you can find clams and other kinds of marine creatures, and in some cases you can find ones that don't exist now. In fact, if you study the whole structure of the area I live in, you see repeated areas of limestone, uh, just as you would expect if the earth was rising. And as it first comes above the water, you've got these coral reefs forming. And then as it continues to rise, those coral reefs are above water. They dry out and uh, become limestone. Thank you. Dr. Olden? OK. Here's a public school textbook saying climbers reaching the top of Mount Everest plant their victory flags over the remains of animals that once lived in the sea. It's a simple fact that the top 3,000 feet of Mount Everest is indeed full of sedimentary rock loaded with seashells. Here's an article from the paper uh, last year, two years ago. Um, paleontologist, whatever his name is here, rests on a giant fossil oyster found in Peru. Uh, more than 500 giant fossil oysters were found two miles above sea level some of which are 11 and a half feet wide and 661 pounds. Well, interesting, these oysters are in the closed position. Petrified clams in the closed position are found all over the world, including the top Mount Everest. Now, when a clam dies, it opens. You can walk along the beach and find a billion seashells. You hardly ever find a matched pair, and you don't find them closed if they're dead. They open, the muscle relaxes, it's just a natural response. So I think the best explanation of petrified clams, and sometimes they're found up to 10 feet thick, solid petrified clams, jammed in there, closed and petrified. To me, it's not a problem. The flood would have underwater, what are called turbidity currents, mudslides underwater move incredibly fast. There was one turbidity current that cut the transatlantic cable years ago. They said it had to move 70 miles an hour underwater, the mud flow. I think during the flood in the days of Noah, you would get incredible turbidity currents that would bury beds of clams.